Welcome to the Good News Ride Home for Wednesday, August 12th, 2020. I'm Jackson Bird. The rumor clinics that combated fake news during World War II, how scientists have turned ordinary bricks into supercapacitors, why some groceries are still tough to come by, and your chance to have a sleepover at the last remaining blockbuster in the world. Here are some cool things from the news today. Between QAnon and Pizzagate, plus just deep fakes and filter bubble-fueled echo chambers, it is easy to feel like we're living in an especially volatile moment of misinformation. But the tendency to believe and spread misinformation, rumors, or conspiracy theories is hardly new. Sure, the internet and corporate-run algorithms are exacerbating things quite a bit, but they're only pumping up what is already human nature. And at some point, I want to dive a bit deeper into some humans' tendencies towards superstition and magical thinking. I started this election cycle reading Kurt Anderson's Fantasyland about Americans, in particular's tendency toward individualistic and skeptical types of superstitious thinking. But honestly, the book got a bit too real as the pandemic wore on, so I set it aside for a bit. But today, I don't want to get into all of that. Today, I want to talk about one of the ways that this type of spread of misinformation was combated back during World War II. To begin with, here are just some of the rumors that were circulating around the United States in the 1940s, quoting Mental Floss. There was one about a lady whose head exploded at a beauty salon after her perm ignited residue from her job at the munitions factory. Others claimed Japan was planning to spike America's water supply with arsenic, and that a Massachusetts couple reported picking up a hitchhiker who claimed Hitler was on the verge of defeat before vanishing like a ghost from the back of their car, end quote. And some darker rumors from Atlas Obscura, quote, No U.S. Navy vessels survived Pearl Harbor. A mother in Minnesota received a box from Japan containing the eyes of her captured soldier's son. Men and women were being killed at shipbuilding corporations for supporting military efforts. A bomb containing bubonic plague germs was dropped in Curry County, Oregon. And the waves, or women accepted for volunteer emergency service, were considered property of army officers, and the officers could do with them what they pleased. End quote. There was also a rumor about a scrawny kid who had been rejected by the military like half a dozen times before being experimented on by a shady government operation and turned into a super soldier. Okay, that last one was just printed in the comic books in the 1940s, but hey, someone might have believed it. And many people did believe that the onslaught of rumors could dampen the nation's morale and endanger the overall war effort. Also, quoting Mental Floss again, other tales reinforced racism and other prejudices already present in the country. Some of those rumors included that Jewish people were not required to serve in the military or that white soldiers were having black children after receiving Red Cross blood donations from black civilians, end quote. Yeah. And there was also a concern, according to a 1943 New York Times article, that some rumors would be intentionally proliferated by a German propaganda effort. Sound familiar? The first initiative to combat the rumor mill came in the form of a weekly column in the Boston Herald. Started by Harvard professors Gordon Alport and Robert Knapp, the Herald worked with the Eastern Psychological Association, the Massachusetts Committee on Public Safety's Division of Propaganda Research, the Boston Police Commissioner, the State Attorney General, representatives of local unions, the Chamber of Commerce, and a large team of volunteers, primarily university students, who hunted down the sources of rumors in order to dispel them. It was a serious operation. And that summer, President Franklin Roosevelt created the Office of Wartime Information, or OWI, which was meant to subdue falsehoods by only promoting positive wartime information. Part of the thinking was that rumor clinics, like the one at the Boston Herald and others that followed under Robert Knapp's direction, could actually be helping to spread the rumors further by mentioning them at all. And while Robert Knapp disagreed with this, it makes a bit of sense to me as someone living in the year 2020 who witnesses the huge mistrust of mainstream media from, well, all manner of people, but especially those prone to conspiracy theories. And this was true in a way in the 1940s as well. 
or at least a mistrust of the government, particularly after the bombing at Pearl Harbor, when it took three weeks for the federal government to release an official statement. And while many more official OWI rumor clinics across the nation were initially planned, housed primarily at universities and with instructions to report back to the OWI, the rollout never completely happened. Quoting Atlas Obscura, Officials were uncomfortable with social scientists having any level of information control, and social scientists could not work within the politics of the establishment. End quote. Sounds about right. The Boston Herald Rumor Clinic kept going, however, and their success led to independent rumor clinics propping up all around the country, much to the consternation of the Roosevelt administration. Quoting Atlas Obscura, Eventually, the government went on the warpath, launching a campaign against the local clinics. A set of guidelines was issued in October of 1942 outlining how the clinics should run. Groups that wanted to set up a new rumor clinic were sent an extensive questionnaire. For those who managed to get through the labor-intensive process, they were then sent a rumor Bible. The Bible outlined an organizational structure requiring each clinic to have a project director, research director, an educational director, analytical assistants, field reporters, and a general advisory council. Most groups lacked the time and resources to meet OWI's extravagant requirements, and the concept became entangled in a web of bureaucracy and red tape. End quote. So, yeah, a great way to make a rumor debunking initiative look honest and transparent. And perhaps unsurprisingly, no rumor clinics survived after the end of World War II. But maybe it's time to bring them back. I mean, I know we have things like Snopes and factcheck.org and all sorts of fact-checking entities, but the idea of locally run civilian organizations is appealing in some way. You know, I think they might be trusted more by the people who need to believe them the most. Like something from within a local community rather than from the federal government or mainstream media or even a nonprofit based thousands of miles away. And because it can be so easy to groan or laugh at certain conspiracy theories, I'll leave you with this last quote from Atlas Obscura and Robert Knapp. Quote, Knapp wrote in his 1944 thesis that rumors express and gratify the emotional needs of communities during periods of social duress. They arise, in his opinion, to express in simple and rationalized terms the uncertainties and hostilities which so many feel. End quote. Scientists at Washington University in St. Louis have figured out a way to turn ordinary bricks into electricity storage devices. Specifically, they have managed to convert the red pigment in many bricks into a plastic that is capable of conducting electricity. Acting as supercapacitors, which store electric charge, unlike batteries, which store chemical energy, these bricks have the potential to be connected to solar panels and store rechargeable energy. Quoting the research brief on The Conversation, Brick's porous structure is ideal for storing energy because pores give brick more surface area than solid materials have, and the greater the surface area, the more electricity a supercapacitor material can hold. Bricks are red because the clay they're made from contains iron oxide, better known as rust, which is also important in our process. We fill the pores in bricks with an acid vapor that dissolves the iron oxide and converts it to a reactive form of iron that makes our chemical syntheses possible. We then flow a different gas through the cavities to fill them with a sulfur-based material that reacts with iron. This chemical reaction leaves the pores coated with an electrically conductive plastic, or PDOT. The resulting film coats the brick surfaces with nanofibers that resemble the fine filaments produced by fungi. The nanofiber structure of our conducting polymer has low electrical resistance, as well as high surface area, which makes it ideal for energy-related applications. End quote. And their study, which was published in the journal Nature Communications, showed that only a few of these bricks are required to light up an LED. And they say about 60 of them could power emergency lighting for 50 minutes, and that each brick could be recharged 10,000 times. They say that they're working on increasing the amount of energy that the bricks can store, and also scaling up the chemical synthesis in order to reduce cost and time that it takes to produce the bricks. They'd also like to design them to be ready to go without the need for wires and be able to be assembled similar to Lego bricks. Part of the team's enthusiasm for the project is continuing to prove how waste products can be upcycled for creative uses. Quote, Turning rust into a useful chemical source material is cost-effective and demonstrates how inert materials hold the potential to be transformative in chemical manufacturing. 
Our work shows how waste can be upcycled and reused for producing cutting-edge materials that extend the functional limitations of construction materials. End quote. And it is definitely fascinating to think about how we can reimagine sustainable energy efficiency in building structures. I mean, literally reimagine it brick by brick. All right, we all remember at the start of lockdown when it was near impossible to find toilet paper, paper towels, disinfectant wipes, or hand sanitizer anywhere. Most of those have bounced back, not disinfectant wipes, which remain in short supply due to a combination of incredible demand. Clorox increased production by 40%, but demand is up 500%. And competition for raw materials with the more crucially needed PPE. Hand sanitizer has actually reemerged in huge quantities. At most stores in my neighborhood, there are shelves upon shelves of various hand sanitizers, but hardly any hand soap. A few expensive brands of hand soap remain, but the shelves are largely empty or else replaced with hand sanitizer. And it's been going on for months now. And I am super frustrated by this because soap and water cleans better than hand sanitizer, and a bunch of hand sanitizer brands have been recalled by the FDA. So it just all seems like a little much to me. And as the months go on, there have been various groceries that remain tough to find. Some of the ones that I am personally interested in and have had trouble finding include Oscar Mayer turkey bacon, which I think might have been affected by some of the meat packing plant closures. All of the turkey bacon was gone at first, but Oscar Mayer has remained the hardest brand to find. Also, lactose-free Yoplait yogurt, the exact flavors of two different types of cheeses that I like to buy, and mini chewy sweet tarts, specifically in the movie theater boxes, which most stores around me sell for a dollar, so they're my favorite. My hunch there is that maybe the candy companies aren't making or distributing their movie theater box versions of their candies since movie theaters are closed. It's a stretch. I haven't actually verified any of these hunches, but I know that other people have particular items that they've been keeping their eyes on too, and I've been really curious about which particular groceries are still hard to find and why this is the case. The biggest thing to know is that even though grocery stores feel mostly back to normal, they're actually still operating with less stock than usual. Quoting the Wall Street Journal, During the peak shopping spree at the end of March, stores ran out of 13% of their items on average. Now, roughly 10% of their items remain out of stock, compared with a normal range of 5-7% to before the pandemic. And that might not seem significant, but leaving shelves 90% full for half a year would cost the supermarket industry some $10 billion in lost revenue, according to research from trade associations." And while items like paper products, over-the-counter medicine, dairy products, and frozen fruits and vegetables have bounced back this summer, other items like coffee, frozen meats, refrigerated dough, canned vegetables, school and office supplies, pest control supplies, vitamins, household storage and cleaning, all remain in short supply. And the Wall Street Journal goes on to say, quote, Manufacturers and retailers are focused on making, delivering, and stocking their top-selling items. And this can lead to out-of-stocks of niche or seasonal items, such as barbecue tools. Other aisles have less stock because the sector simply can't make enough. For instance, flour mills are behind on deliveries despite boosting production by as much as 40%. End quote. And this actually makes sense for the items I've had trouble finding. I'm lactose intolerant, so a lot of what I buy is already pretty niche, you know, dairy-free or vegan alternatives. And beyond that, the items that I've had trouble finding in some cases aren't the actual item, but a particular variety that I want. Or there's also, you know, the things like turkey bacon and hand soap, which are extremely popular and therefore probably fall into that other bucket where boosted production still isn't enough to meet demand. Another interesting finding, at the start of the pandemic, many grocers decreased the number of discounts that they were running on common consumer goods, things like two-for-one deals, because instead they were having to actually limit how many items bought per customer. But notable exceptions to this? Grooming products and sports and energy drinks. Not caring about our appearances as much and not being able to pick up a quick drink at a convenience store because many of them were closed has apparently made those sectors struggle. So look out for coupons and discounts on those if you want to stock up. And now, obviously, not being able to reliably find mini chewy sweet tarts in any store that I go into is not a huge issue. 
I'm slightly more concerned about the hand soap, but it also means that I've been getting to try some really interesting variations. Like in June, I went to the store and literally the only one available was a scent called Halloween Moon. No information on the label about what the scent actually is, just Halloween Moon. So no, I'm not complaining about the shortages I have personally been experiencing at this juncture, but it has been fascinating to follow and kind of track the patterns. And I am genuinely interested in what particular items other people are still having trouble finding either consistently or at all in grocery stores. So if you've got any, tweet them to me at jackisnotabird, link in the show notes, and maybe I will share a few of these at the end of the show later this week. The dream of the 90s is alive in, well, not Portland, Oregon, but Bend, Oregon. You may have heard before about the only operational blockbuster in the world, the last standing blockbuster rental store that is located in Bend, Oregon. They've managed to stay open at this point by sheer gimmick, which they've leaned into by becoming a sort of 90s time capsule. And they have even recently gotten some press about how determined they are to remain open even after the financial hit they're taking from the pandemic. Now, perhaps to help with that, or perhaps just because it is a fun thing to do, they have now listed their store on Airbnb. For three nights in September, three sets of lucky guests will get to experience a sleepover in an actual blockbuster store, which I'm sure is exactly what all of you had on your bucket list. The Airbnb listing notes that guests will have free reign of the store and that it will be cleaned in between each guest's stay, according to Airbnb's protocols and the CDC's guidelines. Guests will even be given a care package of masks, sanitizer, and disinfectant wipes. But apart from that 2020 pandemic-themed invasion, everything else is set up to be a true 90s experience. They decked out a corner of the store to look like a classic 90s living room, complete with an oversized TV inside of an armoire, a beanbag, and a pull-out couch with geometric shape printed sheets. They even have a VCR and retro-themed bags of Doritos. If you are in the Bend area or can safely get there, the Blockbuster Airbnb will be open for reservations starting at 1 p.m. Pacific on August 17th. And it seems like all you have to do is book it. There's no contest or anything, so really it's just going to be a race of internet speeds to see which three parties can get through first. But for anyone who doesn't manage to snag a reservation, the living room setup will remain in the store for customers to view during limited hours. And if you are nowhere near Bend, Oregon, the store is still happy to help you find a movie to watch. Quoting from the Airbnb posting, Call the store to take advantage of our Calgorithm. Tell us what you like and don't like, and a real human will give you tailored recommendations. End quote. I love that. Some friends of mine who own a store called Wonder Fair in Lawrence, Kansas, do a similar thing, focusing on human-fueled anti-algorithm recommendations. And speaking of 90s nostalgia clashing with social media, I first heard about this whole situation when I saw a tweet from Blockbuster, who had not posted anything on Twitter since 2014, And the tweet said, just checking in with a wave emoji and was preceded by two retweets from Airbnb. So some clever wordplay there. Eight hours later, Blockbuster tweeted again, quote, okay, we've seen enough. Checking out. Yeah, same. Blockbuster, same. Stay in the 90s where it's safe. That is it for today. As always, this show was produced by Ride Home Media. I am Jackson Bird. And like I said, I would love to hear what groceries you are still having trouble finding if you want to tweet those to me at Jack is not a bird. Link in the show notes. I hope you all have a good rest of your day, and I will talk to you tomorrow.